go ahead and get started. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Joe Bovey, who visits us from the from Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, recently, well, not that recently, I guess a couple of years ago, finished his graduate work from the from NYU, New York University, with David Hogg, who will actually be visiting us next week. Uh, he's now working on some other great things, and he's one of the his, really his research is challenging. I think some of our notions of what we think about the Milky Way galaxy, and I'm really pleased to have you here today to tell us about it. Great. Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so yeah, I want to tell you today about some new uh, precision measurements that I've made of the properties of the Milky Way's disk and what they can tell us about the evolution of the Milky Way's disk and the formation and of disk galaxies in general. And so this is an important problem in galaxy formation because in doing, starting from a cosmological initial condition and forming realistic disk galaxies at regime zero remains a very difficult problem it's a recent progress, um, but it's still good to, to do more observations, get more data um, that we can use to test models for the uh, formation of disk galaxies. Um, and I'll just point out that many of the stars in the Wave like, Zero universe, universe live in galaxies, uh, with, uh, in the disks of galaxies that uh, uh, similar to the Milky Way. Um, and now, the Milky Way is very special. Uh, amongst all the galaxies, and that it provides us a very detailed view of the properties of a of a galaxy. It's just a single galaxy, but we can get uh, we can get 6D phase space information. We can get information on the ages of individual stars and the abundance of individual stars. This is all very hard to do in external galaxies, and so it's a, a unique, like very detailed microscopic view of of the galaxy. Uh, and so I'll try to talk about a new way of, of approaching uh, looking at the Milky Way's disk, of slicing it into different populations, and what its the implications of this are. Yeah, so I'll start with a, a short introduction on uh, the basic ingredients for disk formation and evolution, um, and then I'll talk about work I've been doing and exploring the Milky Way using monoabundance populations, or maps. That's either star, stars that have all very similar elemental abundances. So I'll we'll first look at the spatial distribution uh, of stars in such populations, what their spatial density is, what kind of disks they live in. Uh, and then I'll look at the kinematics of these, uh, these same populations. Uh, and then I'll make a quick detour um, to talk about the galactic dynamics that you can do with these, these populations. If you have their spatial distribution and their kinematics, you can put those two together and figure out what the gravitational potential is. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but then I'll end with putting all the, the, the results from the maps uh, together into a new view of the Milky Way's disk and what it teaches us. So very quickly and very briefly, galactic disks are thought to be formed from the inside out, but there's, uh, there's really very little direct observational evidence for this, uh, certainly up to now, but a little bit more of it is coming in recently, but so this is something that we really want to test about the formation of disks. Um, but then once the galaxy disk forms, their subsequent evolution due to heating, and there's non-asymmetric uh, structures in the disk that can move stars around. Uh, that erases the signatures of the formation. And what we see today is the present day Milky Way disk. So we can we can only see the, the disk structure as it is today. So it is hard to disentangle the, the formation and the evolution and the subsequent evolution in what we see today. Um, so the question is, can we tag, in any sense, the building blocks of the disk that, that form the disk and trace their evolution separately and, and thus disentangle the formation and evolution of the disk that way? Um, and a very specific question is uh, that for disks, there's a very the typical view is that they have a thin disk and a thick disk. Um, it's not clear how this thicker disk component forms, but it's, and it's not even clear whether this is correct. And I'll talk about a lot about that so just a little more on these thick disk components. Uh, I guess it is a little bit cut off at the top, but it's fine. We don't see anything here anyway, so here's the plane. Um, so thick disk components um, are, are components with a large scale height um, in, the, in, this, in the disk of galaxies. So typical scale heights, if you, if you characterize the vertical distribution of stars in the disk, but the scale height is typically about 300 parsec for, for the Milky Way and Milky Way-like galaxies. These thick components have a scale height of about a kiloparsec, so it's about three times uh, larger. And these are too thick to be formed by kind of regular heating, by spiral arms and scattering off of molecular clouds. There has to be 
an additional mechanism that creates components at this, these large scale heights. Uh, these have been studied in, in quite a bit of detail, mostly in the Milky Way, although also somewhat in external galaxies. And typically what we find is that these components are old, they're metal poor and enriched in alpha elements, so they seem like a very old population that was formed relatively early on in the evolution of the disk. Um, they're kinematically warm, so they're old. They're, old. They're, old. they're old populations of stars. Now, they could result, there's many scenarios, we'll talk about some on the next slide. They could result either from just direct forming formation of a thick disk, or they could uh, be formed through the evolution of the disk or through an external event. It's unclear, and it's even unclear from measurements whether there's really two distinct components. So the, the typical evidence that you get for a thick disk component is if you look at the vertical number counts of stars, which is here from SESS, uh, you see if you just look at the, the number counts as a function of height above the plane, there's this first exponential with a short, with a small scale height of about 300 parts second. And then at the, at the, in the tail, you see this second exponential component with this kiloparsec scale height. And so that you can fit perfectly well with two scale heights, and so that's why you think that there's a thin disk and a thick disk. But it's unclear, but that might just be a fitting function there might be things in between there that you're not seeing here. So that's the question. Now, as I said, that there's many, there's a few different things that can form to a big disk. Uh, for example, there was long uh, thought that if the big disk had to be due to the kind of merging activities that galaxies do. Uh, for example, an external, a minor merger with an external galaxy could just directly accrete a bunch of stars uh, from, a, from a satellite galaxy or it could just heat the, the disk that was existing before this merger, but it gets heated by this dynamical accretion uh, of the satellite. Uh, so that's kind of like an external event. Uh, it could also be a more internal event, like a wet merger, which is a merger with a lot of, that brings in a lot of gas, uh, could induce a period of rapid star formation that could uh, lead to a thicker disk component that would be alpha enhanced. Um, and so that's another way to perform it. Um, could also be internally, completely internal, with uh, the interact, the spiral arms can, can make stars migrate over large distances in the plane, and as stars migrate outwards from, from orbits in the inner galaxy to orbits in the outer galaxy, um, they feel less restoring force as you go to the outer galaxy, and so they form a thicker disk component. And so that's a way that you can completely internally uh, by this migration of stars over many kiloparsecs, you can form a thicker disk component. Um, or it could be that the disk was just formed hot at high redshift because the disk was turbulent, um, the disk instabilities, um, and the disk could have just more gradually settled, the gas could have just gradually settled into a thinner, thinner component. And thus it could have just have formed thick as well. It doesn't have to be heated necessarily. Uh, so let me just uh, have a few specific questions that I want to uh, discuss in the talk. Uh, so, first of all, what is the thin disk scale length and scale height? There have been many measurements of this before, but there's no real good measurements of the scale length. They, can, they go anywhere between two and five kiloparsec. Uh, you know, the, the scale heights are typically 300, or somewhere between 200 and 400 parsec measurements are, have been made. Uh, so what is this, what are these scale heights and scale lengths? Um, now, is the structure in the kinematics the same for all populations of stars? Or are there differences between different populations of stars, such as different ages or different abundances? Uh, and if, if there is a different structure for different populations, what is the mass weight of structure of the stars? Uh, the mass weight of densities? Uh, and do they, do, they, uh, do they agree with what you infer from just doing dynamics? Uh, you, can, you can measure the mass dynamically as well, and that should uh, ideally, agree with what we see just in stars. You measure it directly the distribution of stars, and if it doesn't agree, it might indicate that there's some missing matter uh, potentially in a disk component. Uh, now, there's a thick disk. Um, kind of what is its scale height and scale length? There's no real uh, good measurement of the scale lengths, especially of these thick disk components. We don't have a scale height of about a kiloparsec, but we don't know what the scale length of them is. And then, what is the relation between the structural thickness and the chemical thickness, which is the structural thickness is the component that has a, a scale height of about a kiloparsec. Um, but if you look at stars very close to the sun, within about 50 parsecs, you can take high resolution spectra of these stars and measure their abundances. And if you do that 
see that there's a distinct population. If you look at the metallicity versus the alpha enhanced of the stars, uh, there's a very distinct population that, has, that is alpha enhanced compared to the more solar-like stars that are here. And so these, if you look at their kinematics, they suggest that they're in a thicker disk. I mean, you can't directly measure this because it's all very local. Um, and so it's unclear exactly what the relation is between the stars that you see here locally that are alpha enhanced and have this, this warm kinematics and between the stars, you know, at a kiloparsec or two kiloparsec that are in this thick disk component. Uh, and, what, and more generally, what is the relation between the thick disk and the rest of the disk? Uh, and also, I'd like to discuss a little bit about how the disk grows over time. So these are just some general questions to keep in mind during the talk. So I said that we want to we want to identify the building blocks of the disk to disentangle the formation versus evolution. And so how do you tag disk populations? Now it's clear that position is a bad tag, although it's often used that way. People will select stars at you know a kiloparsec and say these are big disk stars, but there's obviously a huge overlap in populations if you just look at the positions. Uh, it's a function of evolution as well. You know there are these migration mechanisms. There's heating. So the position of a star, the typical position of a star, changes um, over time, typically. Um, and so the velocities you know, are similarly problematic. There's a huge overlap in velocities. People often will try to select thicker disk stars by just picking stars that have kind of extreme kinematics. Um, but you know, that's, there's a huge overlap, and so you're just kind of biasing your result from the get-go. Also, velocity changes over the lifetime of the star. Now, so I will argue that the elemental abundances are a much better tag because they are constant over the age of a star, the lifetime. And you know, if you really want to, in, in, so you can use them as tags to kind of like tag the, the stars. They, they will still stay the same over their lifetime. And if you really want to interpret these in terms of kind of like this formation models, you know, you require some sort of chemical evolution model <coughs> to interpret the abundances versus like the time structure, for example. But there is a basic interpretation that you know. More metal poor stars are older than the more metal rich stars, especially more alpha enhanced stars are older than metal than, than less alpha enhanced stars. And so you can kind of use that um, as just saying that you know with time there's an evolution towards more solar abundances. Um, and so that allows us to introduce the concept of maps, which have been cut off. Uh, so these are that said maps, modern abundance populations. Um, so the idea here is. That, so this is, I'll show this plot a few times more, so I'll be using segway data and I'll say a little more about them uh, in a few slides. But so these are just, these are sample stars that I'll be using mostly. It's 30,000 stars for which we have measurements of their metallicities and their alpha enhancements. I have a pause. I think someone has pulled with the zoom on our projector, it's actually on the light. I mean, you, you probably can't see it. We can't. Oh, the projector was in place. The what? The oh, it's ah, yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> we can actually see it better if you think we can. Yeah, right, right, okay. So yeah, I didn't notice that. <laughs> Okay, so no problem then. Okay, so maps. There you go. Okay, so these are the stars in the metallicity alpha enhancement plane. And so there's a wide distribution of stars that we have in our survey. Um, and then maps is just saying, you know, let's take stars that have very similar properties for these abundances. So just let say like stars in a little in a little rectangle here, call and you call these stars map. They have abundances that are about a, a single value. These are about the size of the air. Boxes, and so those are maps of stars with just very similar abundances. Uh, now, and I'll argue, I'll use a lot during the talk that the alpha enhancement here, so this axis, that is basically an age measurement, um, which is uh, you know, what you see. That's what you typically see in chemical evolution. But there's also recently an actual direct measurement of stars in the solar neighborhood of their ages and their alpha enhancements. And you see that there's a one-to-one -one correlation that allows you. To basically say that alpha is some nonlinear function of age, but you get some relative age ranking from using the alpha enhancement. So then the question is, what are the spatial kinematic structures of stars of each of these maps? And what does that tell us about the global structure of the disk? So let's get started with the real meat here. Um, so, okay, so the object is to study the phase space distribution to the, of the stars of a given abundance. Set of a given map. And I'll start with just looking at the densities and the distribution of positions of, of a given abundance in the disk. 
segue so that is probably a little hard to get put together. But <laughs> so these are this is the segue survey, which is what I'll be using uh, in all of the talk. It's the whole it's part of SDSS to uh, the whole survey spectra for about 240,000 stars, their medium resolution spectra. Um, they go quite faint, 20th magnitude. Um, we can measure the atmospheric parameters, and the stellar parameters, and the abundances for these stars to quite good accuracy, especially so the metallicity to about 0 0.1, 0 0.15 depths, the alpha enhancement to about 0 0.1 depths, which is good enough to do this math decomposition. Um, we have photometric distances. These are all main, what I'll be using are main sequence stars. Uh, we have their metallicity, so we can get photometric distance that's good to 10 or 12%. Um, we have spectra for all the stars again. So we have line of sight velocities. We also have proper motions for all the stars. We have the full 60 phase space information and these abundances, so we're in business. Uh, and these have some subsets of the segue data have a relatively simple selection, although relative is maybe a relative word to use here, as you'll see. Um, so I'll be using the G dwarfs in particular. These are just selected using a color cut, um, just in G minus R, and these are simple color magnitude box in Segway. We just you know, take a log G cut to get the dwarfs, a uh, signal to noise cut to get the abundance is good enough. And that gives us about 30,000 stars, which are shown here again in the metallicity versus health enhancement plane. Uh, and so, so this seems like there's some sort of like you know, two peak distribution, but again, I'll say this is very much influenced by selection effects, uh, which we'll be talking about. Uh, so don't make too much of that, but uh, you can just, if you just look at the stars in, for example, this box that has stars with mostly solar-like abundances, and you look at where they are located in space, so in R versus Z, um, you see that these seem to be in a much thinner disk than the stars here that have more metal core alpha mass abundances. They're much more extended vertically. But again, this is very strongly uh, influenced by selection effects. Of course, yeah, mostly yeah, there's nothing here strong selection effects, I would say. Um, and so, so the, the object is to take these selection effects out of the sample to really pair these things more quantitatively. Uh, so the selection function, we just determine it empirically. Uh, we know that Segway samples each line of sight uniformly in its color magnitude box down to uh, this limiting magnitude of 20.2. But then because of the signal to noise cut and the fact that the survey you know, doesn't integrate each, uh, it integrates each line of sight Similarly, no matter what the you know the, the photometric conditions were that night, no matter what the dust the, the, towards that line of sight is, so there's a, a, a brighter cutoff induced by a signal to noise that depends on each line that's different for each line of sight. Um, but we can empirically determine that cutoff by just checking you know where's the faintest star that we see in the spectroscopic sample, and that seems to be a good description of just what the selection where the selection function cuts off. Um, and then you can determine also directly from the underlying photometric sample that we have from the photometric SESS survey, we can we can determine the fraction of stars that were sampled by the survey. So that's shown here in the bottom panels. Um, here versus R, this is R, lactocentric radius versus the height above the plane, Z. Um, so this is uh, just for a fiducial kind of photometric distance, shows you that if you look out at the pole, it shows a selection fraction along these lines of sight. If you look up at the pole out of the plane of the disk, we pick up almost every star in this color range. Let's say we observe it's close to 100%, but then if you look closer to the disk, we only pick up 10 or 5% of the stars. And so that gives you this, that leads to a pretty strong selection effect. But you need to take that out to measure scale heights and scale length. Uh, now, this is a little complicated also because the selection function is in terms of an R band magnitude whereas the underlying spatial density model is in terms of distance uh, you know, position. And to go between, we've used the photometric distance relation that, you, that depends on color and metallicity. So you have to fold all of those things in in sort of a sort of forward model um, if you want to measure the scale length and the scale heights of these populations. So you can do that by doing a likelihood-based density fit for you. Have. You can think of this as that the sample of stars that you see is a Poisson process with a rate parameter that depends on not just the position of the stars, you know, position of the sky and the distance, um, but also on the magnitude, the color, and the metallicity, because those are what you need to go from 
the underlying spatial model to the observed uh, magnitudes that you see. And so this rate you can rise as the combination of, so the most important term, is the underlying density, is what we'll be interested in, the underlying spatial density, but then there's, there's a Jacobian because you're looking from the sun and not from the galactic center. There's a selection function that I showed, which tells you how many stars are picked up at a given magnitude and color uh, and, a, and a given line of sight, even here is a plate. But then, you know, to go from between these two, you need the photometric distance relation, so you need some sort of density in the, in the magnitude, color, metallicity plane as well, uh, which just encodes the photometric distance relation. So that allows you to fold all of the effects of the selection in into the analysis properly, taking all of these things into account. Log likelihood, you know, it looks complicated, but it's actually quite simple. It's just, you, know, you just normalize the observed rate, which is kind of a probability. You normalize it, normalize it by the kind of effective volume of things you could observe, which, affect, which normalizes this to be a probability, uh, the proper probability over the observed volume. Uh, so that's, you know, it looks, there's a horrible integral here, which is, takes most of the time in any of these analyses to calculate, uh, which is, but that's just kind of the effective volume of the survey. And then, so the funny thing is, I'd like to point this out, because it's quite kind of funny. Because for any individual star, if you're only you're interested in the spatial density, so the model parameters only come in here, because, because the rate for an individual star only comes in through the log, all of these other multiplicative effect factors just drop out. They don't, they don't matter. They just give you a constant term for the log likelihood. So you don't actually have to evaluate the selection function for any individual star, or just Jacobian for any individual star. It only comes in in the, in the effective volume. So that allows you to quickly go, to, go through the stars, the individual stars. The problem doesn't entirely really scale with the number of stars. You need to calculate the effective volume more accurately if you have more stars. But that's not quite lit. Anyway, uh, so we can do these fits. Uh, and I'll, so I'll, I'll be fitting combinations with exponential disks, radial exponentials, vertical exponentials to these individual maps. Uh, but just here to start, this is just a fit to a pretty big bin in abundances. Uh, so if you fit just all of the stars here that have solar-like abundances with a radial exponential and a vertical exponential, then you get that these stars are indeed in a very thin disk. The histogram is the observed number counts, and the, the solid line is the model that includes all of such, and that's the best fit model. Uh, and so that fits quite well. We can, do, we can fit the radial distribution uh, quite well as well. This is using some, sorry, so that's just the exponential all of the model. So the right, so it's just, exponent, it's just like an exponential in R and an exponential in Z, absolute value of Z. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, so it's a very thin disk with a quite long scale length. So these solar like abundant stars here. And then if you go to more alpha enhanced stars that are still you know, not terribly alpha enhanced and still solar metallicity, you see that they're in a slightly thicker disk and their scale height is quite a bit smaller. Now if you go even further, you go to more alpha enhanced stars that are also more metal poor, these are in an even thicker disk. The thickness is now about 600 parsec and the scaling has decreased a little bit again. Uh, and then if you go to the most alpha enhanced stars, these are in a very thick disk that has a scale height here. So that's 764 parsec. Um, and these are actually quite significant for this number of stars. This is plus or minus eight or something. You can do this very well. Uh, and the scale and the scale length is very small. Uh, and so you see this progression where you go from if you go from from these solar abundant stars here. As you go towards more alpha enhanced stars, the disk gets thicker, and but it also gets more centrally concentrated. Uh, so now these are very broad bins. So we can also do this in these more narrow bins to really get to the maps, the real mono abundance population. Uh, if you do that, you get results like this. So this is for the radial scaling. So this is fitting in each of these pixels, taking the stars in that pixel with those abundances and fitting. A, an exponential in radius and an exponential in height um, to, these, to these stars, and then you get a radial scaling for these populations. And so you see the same progression, although just on this ridge, 
for a sort of solar like stars, solar abundance like stars, you get scale heights that are about three, three to four kiloparsec. And these scale, uh, sorry, scale lengths, and these scale lengths become smaller and smaller as you go to more alpha enhanced stars. And all of the alpha enhanced stars basically have a scale length of about two kiloparsec. Um, now, what you also, so this, if you think of alpha enhancement as time, then this shows uh, as age, then it's kind of similar. Uh, and it shows you that the disk, you know, these are the oldest stars. So they were there when the disk formed, like 10 giga years ago, about. Uh, so that shows you quite directly that the disk grows with time along this ridge, at least. These stars here are very metal core stars. There are not that many of them in our sample. If you look at their orbits, they're all coming to us from the outer galaxy. And they have scale lengths that are very large. So these are stars kind of like associated with the outer galaxy, which has an even longer scaling than the, than the, the stars that have like mean, that, whose mean orbital radii are near the sun. Uh, so these are partly forms. You know, these may be kind of a different disk, or maybe that they just formed later at lower metallicity because the chemical evolution in the outer disk was slower. Uh, but so these are kind of separate from this trend. Another way to look at this, this diagram is that if you look at a given alpha enhancement, you see that there's that the scale length increases as you go to lower metallicities. And that means that there's a radial metallicity gradient at a given alpha enhancement, because the more metal poor stars are in a more extended disk. So as you go away from the galactic center, the typical metallicity becomes smaller, and so there's a radial metallicity gradient. And so this shows, this diagram directly shows also that there's a radial gradient at every alpha, at every age, uh, and that it flattens as a function of age. So you have a very strong gradient here, and it becomes it, it becomes a smaller and smaller gradient up to here, where you can barely see any gradient. So it becomes flat only for the oldest stars. So these are things you can also see by directly measuring the radial metallicity gradient, although that hasn't been done as a function of alpha enhancement before. So that's another constraint on models for the Milky Way. So then we can also look at the vertical structure. Uh, this is now uh, the vertical scale height from the fit, same fit. Uh, so here you see that there's a very clean signature where the, uh, the maps with solar-like abundances are, are in this form the very thin disk. These are scale heights of you know, 250 parsecs about. And as you go to more alpha-enhanced populations, there's an increase in the scale height. But so you see, the scale height is very smooth. You know, there's no break. It seems that every color between blue and red is, is kind of is in here. Very smooth increase in scale height. Uh, and so that kind of you know, shows you that there's all these intermediate populations. Uh, and so these are scale heights, you know, about between five, like about 500 parsecs. That it wasn't, before it wasn't real. Nobody realized that these populations existed. Uh, and so they do seem to be in the Milky Way. Now, now you can ask, well, is each map really a single exponential, or are there two exponentials? Like, is there a thin and a thick disk in each map? So you can fit also two exponentials. So the, so the fits I showed were just fitting a single vertical exponential. But if you fit two vertical exponentials in each, in each of these maps, you basically find the same scale height. Uh, and so there's no, the, the second component either gets a very small amplitude, or it gets a scale height that's exactly the same as the first component. And so you have basically just one component. And so each, each one of these bins is well fit by just a single component and a single scale height. So the signature here is a real signature. It doesn't come about uh, from just mixing uh, two, two components with different uh, relative fractions in between. We also tested that explicitly. These are real components that have a single scale height that's about 500 parsecs. Okay, so just to summarize briefly, from looking at the spatial structure, we can say that the maps uh, have, have exponential profiles both radially and vertically. They're well fit by uh, exponential profiles radially and vertically, and that there's smooth trends in the scale length and the scale height um, with abundance, and these are also anti-correlated. So the scale height, uh, as the scale height increases, the scale length decreases. They're pretty much uh, directly anti-correlated. Okay, so then 
want now to talk about kinematics briefly. Uh, I'm going to spend too much time on this. This is now looking at the distribution of velocities for a map given their positions. Okay. Well, what is their kinematics as a function of position? Uh, previous studies have looked at this. Uh, these are two studies from SDSS before. Um, and what you find is if you just look at all the stars, you don't split them up by abundance, you see that there's a strong increase in the dispersions um, as a function of height above the plane. This is height above the plane, so this is all pretty close to the plane, up to a kiloparsec, but this is, for example, vertical. Velocity dispersion rises very uh, rapidly as you go to larger heights. Um, and if you, and here you see the same. This is another study that doesn't really have much metallicity resolution. So you see these increases in velocity dispersion that are quite big. Factor two, you know, increased by 100% over a kiloparsec or so. So we can ask with our maps, do we see the same behavior within each of these maps, or is it different? So we take the data, we have the velocities, uh, and we fit a model for the vertical velocities to them. It's just that it's a Gaussian with a dispersion, uh, vertical velocity dispersion that is some second order polynomial with height. So we can get, we got trends like this, and it's radially. An exponential. So we fit that to each of the maps. And this is the model. You know, just a Gaussian velocity distribution with some dispersion and some polynomial and a radial exponential. And we fit that to each of the maps. And then you see the typical velocity dispersion has the same smooth increase as if, as you go to more alpha enhanced metal core populations that we saw in scale heights. So that has to be the case because they are related to the dynamics. Dynamics is the same for all of the for all the populations, so it has to be the same. So you see, that's a good check. Uh, but then also, what you see is that for each of these populations, uh, if you look at this, what this this profile, the vertical profile of the vertical velocity dispersion is for these populations, you see that it's very quite flat. Uh, so if you look in a single map, you get one of these lines, and it's a very flat line. It doesn't increase. Strongly, and this is over multiple kiloparsecs. Uh, and so that seems to hold for pretty much every of these models on these populations. They're very, they're isothermal. And so they're smooth, and then there's a smooth increase in age. It's not smooth increase in age, but it really is kind of backwards saying that the, the stars that formed first have a higher scale height velocity dispersion. Right. 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 So these are the ones that formed first. Right, and the age have the largest right. dispersion is at scale heights. Right, the age mean. Right, right. right. Older so stars. These are the oldest stars. Right, your errors would point out things that formed earlier. Right, right, right. So, right. so if you evolution wise, the errors should point right away. Yeah, I'm not saying which way the evolution went. <laughs> but, right, just so zoom in on this plot again. If you if you combine all of these estimates for the slope, you know, they seem all pretty consistent with having a single slope. But if you combine all the estimates, you get the slope is smaller than about a kilometer per second per kiloparsec. So it's a very, they're very close to isothermal. You know, for each one, this is hard to measure. You know, the, the error is about five kilometers per second per kiloparsec on the slope for each single one. But because they all look so isothermal, the combined slope, uh, the combined PDF, is that you know, they're very close to isothermal. And so that's quite you know, remarkable that they're so close to isothermal. Isothermal populations. Okay, uh, so we can go back to our summaries. And spatially, these maps are exponential in R and Z, and then kinematically, I've just shown you that they are vertically isothermal in the vertical velocity dispersion. I haven't shown you this, but we also checked this for the radial velocity dispersion. This is a little harder for segue to measure because it depends more on the proper motions, which are noisier than the line of sight velocities, but you get. They also seem consistent with being isothermal for the radial velocity dispersions. So both of these dispersions are isothermal. So I'll take a brief detour um, on now talking about dynamics. Um, so we've been studying the phase phase distribution of these maps as by writing it as we first looked at the distribution of the positions for a given map, and then we looked at the, position, the distribution of velocities at a given position. One way of writing the full 6D phase space distribution. But of course, dynamically, another way to write this is if these populations are in steady state, you should be able to write this distribution function 
as being just some function of the actions or of some sort of integral of the motion for each map. And so that then, because the actions depend, or the integrals of the motion, depend on the potential, the gravitational potential, that allows you to constrain uh, the gravitational potential from these maps. And that's a very, it's very sensitive because each of these maps, we've seen, they have very different scale heights and very different dispersions, but they should all give you the same gravitational potential. So that gives you a very strong constraint on the gravitational potential of the Milky Way. So I'll just quickly give a few examples of how we're using this. Um, so all the monoabundance populations should feel the same potential, and so this is from a paper looking at the T dwarfs rather than the G dwarfs. It's a very similar sample. They're slightly redder, but same, same kind of color cut, and so you can measure their scale height and their vertical velocity dispersions uh, similarly as what I said for the, for the, for the, for the G dwarfs. Um, so you can measure, for example, this is now using only three kind of bigger uh, maps. So say they're not really maps anymore. They're just larger, uh, larger bins in abundance. But just if you look at three of these big bins with the K dwarfs, you get, you know, there's, there's the most metal rich population has a short scale height, has a small scale height again, and as you go, there's an intermediate population with a larger scale height, and then the most metal poor health enhanced population again has a large, largest scale height. So you can measure their vertical uh, density profile, and then you can also measure their vertical velocity dispersion profile for these three, uh, these three populations. And then using the genes equation, so this is just doing a 1D genes equation, it's, that's this. 1D genes equation, the vertical one. You can measure the vertical force uh, from the gradients in the in the spatial density and the vertical velocity distribution. So this is just a simple equation which you can uh, put into some sort of likelihood analysis. And what comes out is that you can measure the vertical force as a function of height from these two, from combining these two uh, these two uh, quantities. Uh, so then you get this kind of profile. Uh, it gives you the vertical force profile. Uh, I'll talk more about what the vertical force is at 1.1. So you, can, you get a very robust measurement of what the vertical force is at a height of about 1.1 kiloparsec. Uh, and then you get some information about the vertical uh, distribution, uh, the vertical dependence of this uh, vertical force. And then from the vertical, I didn't write this down, but the vertical force is pretty much. Uh, the same as the surface density integrated up to the density integrated up to that height where you measure the force from the Poisson equation. This is because the rotation curve is close to flat. But um, just take it from me. I have written it down. But yeah, so this is basically the vertical, the surface density. And so then this tells you how the surface density changes. That's why it's here labeled as a surface density. How the surface density changes as a function of height. And so we fit the parametric model. So this is why this looks better. Then of course if we had just measured this at a few points, but you see that you know you get a first a rapid increase from the disk. Most of the matter is dominated by the disk, but then it, you know, once you're at a kiloparsec, the disk is kind of you're above most of the mass, and then you get this linear increase from the dark halo, you know, which is pretty much a constant density component with these heights. Uh, and so that allows you, for example, to measure the density of dark matter you know, within about a kiloparsec to sum get kind of the best measurement of the dark matter density from that. Not to sideline that for a second, wasn't there a measurement a year ago or so that there was a dark matter? You didn't explain yeah, that. Yeah, that's this Bovian and for me one. Right, that's where I should have argued. Wrong. Right. <laughs> that, 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 that measurement was wrong, and if you put it, if you do it right using the same kind of formalism, you, know, you get a measurement that agrees exactly with this K dwarf measurement, which uh, is the red one here. So yeah, so there was actually all over it. And then I'll just go back to the, uh, uh, what's magical about 1.1 kiloparsec? Oh, there's just, nothing magical. It's just a combination of the stars. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just like where most of the stars are. Okay, I understand. It's so really at that point you're just above, you're one scale height above the disk, so you've got most of the mass below you. Right, well, it's mostly just about where the sample lies, because okay. you see from the, from the genes equation, matter. you're mostly, you're measuring it where you measure the density best and the vertical velocity of the first best. So some convolution. I mean, yeah, so probably for this sample, we were probably more close to 800 parsec or something, where you best measure the vertical force. Right. But I'll be talking a little more about 1.1. One, 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 uh, I highlighted this part. Ah, okay. Just a combination of the, the survey plus 
Right. Where it brings the number, the maximum the number of stars can right. get yeah. halted. Right. It's just heuristically. Okay. It all comes from quite an appeal a long time ago. But it's a little historical at this point. Okay, so future data, um, what we really want to do is, if we can do this analysis, that we've only done this kind of analysis only ever at the sun, so at the galactocentric radius of the sun. Um, so you know, just kind of take a look here, for here. So we've done this in this kind of like looking straight up or looking straight down. We've done this. Uh, but really, what we want to do is do this at different galactocentric radii, because then we can measure how the surface density falls off the radius measure what the surface density of the disk is uh, and its radial dependence and then also what the dark halo's surface density is. So I'm going to have to skip through it pretty quickly, but this is what I've been doing most recently. Um, so I've been taking the G-Bore sample now, the one that I show you the maps uh, decompositions for, where we have, we have a 60 uh, base based information. And then because we found that they're isothermal, we can describe them with a simple uh, three interval distribution function that's a quasi isothermal distribution function, which looks like this. It's, actually, it's very simple. It is exponentials in the vertical action and the, ver and the radial action, and then there's some factor that gives you the radial density profile of your tracer sample. Uh, but that's just basically they're just exponentials in the actions. Uh, and so that fits well um, to these maps because this gives you kind of a, a close to isothermal vertical and rate vertical velocity dispersion. Uh, so it has a few free parameters that are just you know, the dispersions, the vertical radial dispersions, and some sort of uh, radial density profile, which is just an exponential. Uh, and then you can, if you have to the, the main problem with this is that you have to calculate the actions. It's very difficult for orbits in the disk, uh, especially orbits that go far, that go up to about a kiloparsec, but you can approximate the, the Milky Way potential is using a stackable potential, and then this kind of works very fast. And then you can do a similar kind of likelihood analysis as I was doing before with the density fits, except that you now really fit the full 60 phase space distribution written as a function of the actions, and that this effective volume integral has become horrendous. Because if you've added three more, uh, three more dimensions to integrate over all the velocities. Uh, but so this can be done. And um, you can do this separately to each of the maps uh, because they should all give you the same potential as you get one. You can get constraints from the different maps and then you can combine that. So I don't have, can't go into any details. I just want to show you, you know, what happens when you do this. Uh, so we find that we can measure, for a single map, we can very well measure what the surface density is at 1.1 kiloparsec height because the Segway G4 sample also kind of Peaks there, although again, it's just chosen for historical reasons and the fact that it seems to agree with where our sample peaks. But so we can measure that very well at a single radius that's different for each of the maps. Uh, and that's because, you know, so the, all these, the solar metallicity, uh, solar abundance maps, their orbits are typically near the sun. And so you measure the dynamics near the sun from those. But the, the maps that are more metal poor. Their orbits, you know, they have a short scale length, and they have a large dispersion. So their orbits are typically in the inner galaxy, closer to five kiloparsec. That's where their mean orbital radii are. So they really probe the dynamics at those radii. And so by combining, by using the different maps, you get measurements of this quantity at different positions. And so if you do this, you get, you get this measurement. So this is now for <coughs> 43 of the maps. We don't fit the ones with the very large scale lengths because they're hard to fit. Um, so all the ones that have a scale length is less than five kiloparsec you can fit using this machinery and you get this one measurement and they all fall beautifully on the line. So you get this nice measurement of the surface density profile where you know the color is the alpha enhancement. So roughly the older, more alpha enhanced stars get this 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 inner re region of the Milky Way and then the, the solar metallicity younger maps give you the, the density near the sun. And then this point that I showed you before also falls perfectly on the line. So you get an exponential, uh, surface density roughly an exponential. And that's mostly because of, <coughs> mostly because of the disk. And so you can do 
a fit then to these data as well as to the terminal velocity curve, and that allows you to then split the, the rotation curve in the Milky Way, which you know the total rotation curve is flat at 220 kilometers per second, but you can then split it between the disk and the halo. And you, can, you, can, you can break the degeneracy between the disk and the halo. Because we, basically, because you can measure the scale length of the disk from these new surface density measurements. So if you just use the measurements of this surface density that I just showed in the previous slide, um, you get, uh, you pretty much directly measure the scale length of the disk. And then that breaks the degeneracy between the halo disk is that the generacy is all because you don't know the scaling of the disk. So what comes out is that the disk is maximal. If you want to know more about this, just ask me later in the afternoon. Go on now. Alright, so last part of the talk. So I want to put the maps results that I showed before together and into like a new view of the disk. So you know for this notion of whether this Milky Way has a thick disk. So the traditional evidence again is based, you know, you do a two component fit to the total star count and you find, you know, you need two components to fit it, but it doesn't it doesn't show you that you don't need more components. Whereas we found, you know, from spatial density that there's a large number of components with scale heights anywhere in between 200 and kil 200 parsec and kiloparsec dispersions, vertical dispersions between 20 and 50 kilometers per second. Uh, and that there's all these intermediate populations. Now, we haven't discussed, you know, we've always I've so far been talking about you know the, the properties of a given map, but I haven't told you, you know, how much mass is there in the different maps. It might still be that these intermediate populations don't have much mass associated with them. If there's, you know, if those have kind of negligible amount of mass, and so you know even though there's you know, a small number of stars in these intermediate populations, there's really still you know, a thick component and a thin component that you can isolate. Um, so, that, so that's something you have to address. Uh, the problem with comparing to older work is that I showed you a little bit of this chemical bimodality of stars near the sun, that they have this clear population with uh, alpha and half stars. It depends a lot on the spectroscopic targeting because most stars in those surveys were sampled as having extreme velocities. And so because we found like there's a strong correlation between the dispersion and, and the population that they're in, that just means that you're probing the extremes of these populations. It doesn't really tell you anything. Although, I will say that the evidence has gotten better that this bimodality locally is real. Uh, yeah. But so we can ask, you know, this is still different volume, so we can ask what in our sample at least is this massive <coughs> distribution of abundances and scale heights. So I'll show this plot. This is the same plot I showed before, but bin differently. So this is again the same sample of stars in Segway. The observed sample um, in metallicity and alpha enhancement and now bin into these bins for which we did the math analysis. And so this shows that in the raw sample you, you see kind of this fine modality. Uh, now, but this depends strongly on the selection effect. So there's the spatial, there's the volume that's been sampled. Um, you know, it's the very faint stars to oversample stars in the thicker components. Uh, Segway also has, I didn't say this, but it has two magnitude bins for each line of sight, and it oversamples the really faint <coughs> end of each of those bins, so it really oversamples stars at very large distances, and thus uh, stars in these thicker components. And then there's a slight effect, which is that the, the mass of the stars changes with metallicity uh, for, for the given color cut. So you're looking at a slightly different, stars with slightly different masses uh, at a given metal for different metallicities in this color range, which you also need to see there. But so we can, we can estimate those effects. Um, and so we can go from these raw sample counts and see you know, how much mass and stars in a column near the sun do you need to, to get to observe these stars. And so then you get to the underlying mass weighted population. If you do that, you know, this completely changes because the, once you correct for all the selection effects, most of the stars are in the thinnest components, the solar metallicity, the solar abundance is components, and then there is a tail towards uh, these more alpha enhanced stars. But there's no very clear break, and there's no clear bimodality here. So this seems like it's just like a smooth distribution. Uh, now, you can also look at 
uh, the distribution of scale heights. So these are, for the maps, these are the scale heights that we measured <coughs> versus this mass that I just showed you, this plane. And there you can see what is the mass weighted distribution of scale heights just by seeing you know, how much mass is there in components with scale heights between 200 and 400 parsec, how much mass is there in the next 200 parsec in scale height. And so you can build this distribution of the of scale heights in the sun, near the sun, and then you get this, uh, this line, this distribution. So this is, again, a very smooth distribution where most of the mass is in these thinnest components, but then there's this fall off uh, of less and less mass in components with larger and larger scale heights. But these components with scale heights of about 500, 600 parsec do have a lot of mass, more than there is in these uh, with the larger scale heights. So that's why we say the Milky Way doesn't really have a thick disk. It just seems to have one disk. There's no real distinction. There's no break or fine modality in its planes. There's certainly no structural <laughs> thick disk. So I'm trying to, try to picture my mind what would it look like with the bimodality. I mean, you'd have, you know, I guess you'd have just a, like, you'd have a gap. You'd have a, like, <coughs> you'd have a tail here. So okay. You know, there would have to be, this would have to stick up. Yeah, it's like a dromedary. I'll show you from a simulation okay. in a few slides. You'll see a simulation that doesn't agree. <laughs> so you see the same in the, in the vertical dispersions, but they're much, they're much uh, noisier. It's measuring the square part of the measuring scale height. Uh, so that's the same. And so it doesn't seem like there's really a distinct thick disk component in the Milky Way, but there is really there's all these maps that are very simple populations. They're exponential profiles in R and Z. They're isothermal in, in their vertical dispersions are isothermal vertically. Um, I didn't talk about this, but the the radial drop-off of dispersions is consistent with being an exponential, uh, you know, roughly twice the scale length of the disk. But that doesn't have to be. But that's got kind of, it's consistent with what you would expect. Um, now, and that seems to indicate that vertical gradients that we saw, such as I showed the vertical gradient in the velocity dispersion, when you don't separate stars by abundance, uh, that those seem to be changes in population with height rather than a change in, within the population. Because if you go to larger heights, you see more of the stars in the thicker components. And so you see more of the stars with high dispersions or with low metallicity or high alpha enhancement. But that's just because you're changing the kind of star you're seeing rather than that the population itself changes. And then it's a challenge for theoretical models to explain why the populations are so simple and what their distribution, how you get their detailed distributions that we measure in the spatial properties. Um, so one thing that's fun is you can put all these maps also back together and see what's the total vertical density profile. And if you do that, you find that it's a, you can fit it exactly with two exponentials. So this is just combining all of these different maps with the mass weighting. And you can generate this vertical profile. And you see there's two exponentials that perfectly fit this. So that's, that's why you thought this before. That's, you know, if we look at all stars, you wouldn't see all these components. As I said, there's this, the one real outstanding discrepancy um, is this, these local analyses. So this is, again, the sample of stars. This is a five. Well, this is a very small sample of stars within 20 parsec. You see it's high resolution. You see there's a clear break. You know, it's a little hard to see because this author has made these dots much bigger than these. But you know, there seems to be a bimodality here in alpha enhancement, which we don't see in our sample. Now, this is 20 parsec around the sun, we're looking multiple kiloparsec. Uh, we only start at 300 parsec anyway. So it doesn't overlap in volume. This could be a small volume effect. Um, there's a, there's a light, slightly larger sample, for example, that comes from exoplanet surveys, which have no biases for galactic kinematics and galactic abundances. It's very nice. Um, but even there, you see, you know, there's a hint of a bimodality in here. There's a break. There's, you know, there's a valley of stars here. Um, and so that's a bit of a discrepancy, you know, it's possible just with regular chemical evolution that you get a little bump at high alpha, just if everything's smooth anyway, so it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, what I can say is that if we extrapolate our model to the plane of the Milky Way, we can, we can predict what the abundance distribution should be, and so we get these dashed lines, um, and so, you know, the overall shape does agree mostly. 
we don't see any dip, of course, because we don't have this. You know, we don't see that. So let me just very quickly go back to these questions. I suppose at the beginning of the talk, so I asked, you know, what is it in this scaling and scale height? Now, that seems to be an ill-posed question because there's all these different populations. But you know, when you say solar chemistry stars have scale height of about 250 parsecs, and scaling about three kiloparsecs, but really there's all these components with very different parameters. Um, so the structure and kinematics, there are multiple populations. Um, you know, there's multiple populations with different scale lengths, for example. Um, and then I didn't really talk about this much, but you know, I, I showed you this measurement of the dynamical structure, which measures the scale length of the mass in the disk. And it, that actually agrees with what you would predict the mass scale length to be from this map distribution. So the mass that you see from the star counts and correcting for all the selection effect agrees with the dynamics that you see. That's also the case for the vertical integrated <coughs> vertical column density of stars. So there doesn't seem to be any missing matter, and it's a nice cross check on these two analyses that they give you the same uh, same uh, now the thickness and scaling, there's no thick disk, but we can measure the scale length anyway. Um, it has a short scale length, so that really means you know all the alpha enhanced populations that are in thicker components all have very short scaling that are about is about two kiloparsec. Now, the relation between all of the, the disks is really if there's just one disk um, and there's just a bunch of you know probably close to infinite number of components of various thicknesses that we've of course we've been in these maps, you know, 63 maps. But, you know, that number doesn't mean anything, obviously. There's just like you know one disk, which is the more continuous distribution of disk thicknesses. And then from the, we see, we saw also from these spatial fits that the disk concentration, the, the scale length, grows with uh, time. The, the disks, you know, the oldest stars were in, in more concentrated, more simply concentrated disks. So that shows you kind of that the disk uh, grew from the inside out. And then the other trends in the anti-correlated trends the scale height versus scale length, and the smooth structure of the scale heights seems to indicate that the thicker components were created through some sort of smooth evolution. Um, so, yeah, I'll just, um, <coughs> my last slides. I don't work much on models themselves, but you know, all of the Milky Way disk formation simulations are being compared to these results. And I would say, you know, preliminarily, you know, they can reproduce some of the features um, it's unclear whether they match all of the trends because I think they take and choose a little what they compare to depending on what their simulation shows. I could show you one from a paper that I was somewhat involved with, which is a, a, a simulation uh, by Greg Stinson where the disk kind of forms mostly thick. If you look at it, uh, this is a cosmological simulation where a disk forms. You see the same as what we see in our data that the older stars are in these thick, centrally concentrated. How much does the radial size change from, say, the top half to the bottom? The radial size in the disk? Yeah, the radial scale length. Yeah, here, uh -huh. so we can make the same plots as what I showed you here yeah, for the simulation. So it's about, there's a similar range in scale lengths. Uh, scale heights are somewhat bigger than what we find. That might be a resolution effect of the simulation, which is a quite poor resolution. Uh, so you see, you see roughly similar trends. Um, in this, so that's a good various things. There's other simulations that are also being compared to this. Um, you know, for example, you see these long scaling components uh, as well, at, at slightly more metal core than the sun. So that's the, I mean, you have the second layer tail or appendage. I'm not that? entirely sure. It's <coughs> on a weird star. <laughs> weird star. Well, but I'll show you this. You can make the same, you can do the same in the simulation looking at the different scale heights, um, the mass and different scale heights, and there's much better in this relation because you can actually you can select the population by age, although it's similar if you do by abundance in this relation. Um, so you get this, you also get a smooth trend in, in scale height versus mass in these components, but when you add it all up, there is this very distinct thick disk. But this is kind of what a distinct thick disk would look like if we can move, and we don't see that here. This is the case in which the simulation doesn't really agree with this. Like it stays thick. This disk stays thick for too long, probably. And then suddenly it becomes much thinner. 
you do create these populations in between, but there's just very little mass in them because it's just happens quite fast. I mean, that is great. But point out perhaps the obvious. I mean, your measurements like less than so right. far, so. <laughs> right. So that's probably a resolution those. effect. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't see this obviously. Either. Like if there was something here, we'd see it. You would have. Yeah. Because right. you would still. I mean, we go up to like three, four kiloparsecs. So if there was so much mass, we would see it. Uh, but yeah. So the scale heights are all probably they're twice as big because of probably the resolution. It's not the last bird simulation. I'll show you just a preview of what's happening. All right, so that's conclusions, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so I showed you that there's no thick disk, but I also told you that the scale length is 2 kiloparsec of the thick disk. Um, you know, assuming that alpha's proxy for age it shows you directly this inside out formation where the disk grows with time, there's a smooth increase in all the quantities, the scale height, the dispersions. Uh, these increases are anti-correlated with the scale length. So that, that seems to indicate that there must be some, that the main driver for the thicker components in the Milky Way is internal evolution, not some external merger. Because external influences like a merger would tend to give you a thicker disk that has a much larger scale length, and the, or the similar scale length to the thin disk or larger scale length um, certainly wouldn't be so nicely anti-correlated. Uh, so it seems to indicate that internal evolution, but it doesn't tell you really, you know, whether it's heating, or better is if the disk got thinner in time. Um, so then, I also hope I convinced you that there's no real distinct big disk in the Milky Way. If we see all these populations in between that have lots of mass associated with them. So thank you. Thank you. There doesn't seem to be much room for like a disk component of dark matter. Uh, so that's mostly because there's no vertical, there's vertical mass. The disk part of the vertical surface density is explained totally by star counts and the, the ISM. And then the scale length that we measure dynamically is you know, the same or a little shorter even than what you get from the direct star counts. And so a dark disk would have a scale length probably have a scale length that's much larger than that of the stars. And so that should give you a mass weighted scaling that's also larger than that of the stars. Whereas we see one that's you know, a little bit less you know, consistent with the stars. So, so there probably can be much dark matter in a disk. Uh, probably like 10% of the local dark matter density could be in a disk maybe. So I haven't worked this out very quantitatively. So people who are trying to do dark matter detections by you know, pointing well, if there's dark matter, does that increase the probability of detection, right. basically, you're saying, don't bother? Yeah, I mean, so that doesn't seem like it's very, it, it might, I mean, if there's 10%, it might still be enough, because it's going to give, like, just a little bit of disk component can give you a big boost, uh, depending on exactly what the mass of the dark matter is. Uh, but it does, there's no evidence at all for any disk dark matter, so you know, it might be that there's none. And so in that case, it would be a deal to see. I think you already have your distributions as function of your actions. Uh, maybe you could add some evolution in your uh, gravitational potential and uh, just start with some plausible, plausible model, or you just showed us some simulations and then see how those distributions evolved back in time, assuming adiabatic invariance, say, for all your actions, and then see whether they were separate before, you know. Right, yeah, I think it'd be very interesting to look at the simulations in terms of the actions. Way of describing the orbits and simulations is not something that people do very often. But I think it might be, it could be very useful for figuring out you know, whether the disk was, whether it was heated or whether it was collapsed more. Uh, and things like radial migration give you very strong predictions for what the action distribution like, should, do, should be, like the vertical action, because it's adiabatic sure. for the vertical action. So, yeah, I think that'd be very interesting. I mean, can you assume? Uh, with age versus alpha enhancement 
function and then uh, use that as an additional constraint on how the, how the evolution works. Yeah, maybe. I haven't thought about that much. But yeah, we, we, we'll certainly be able to measure that much better the alpha versus A for correlation. One more question. Yeah, do you have a <coughs> way to construct the alpha distribution that is polar and includes radio and hands? Oh, you mean the distribution of alpha enhancement as a function of like the azimuth? Yes. This we haven't done that yet. Um, it might be possible when you're using Apogee. Apogee is a different SDSS survey that's looking at the disk or um, with high resolution spectra. Um, yes, that's one thing that I, you could do. I mean, there are like radio migration would, if it's happening right now, you would see azimuthal variations in the mean metallicity and probably also in the mean health enhancement. So that would be very interesting to do. But our sample would segue. It's mostly looking up, so you don't get much coverage in the azimuth. But Apogee will have yeah, a much larger coverage. Yeah. You could ask you about Apogee a lot. Right. All right, I'll let you ask one more question. All right, so uh, did you study the halo population in Halo is still real, or it's maybe just part of your one of the maps? I don't oh, know. Yeah, we haven't looked at the halo in this, so I mean, the maps pretty much stop at a metallicity, metallicity of minus one, and the halo is all below that metallicity. For this sample, because it stays so close to the disk, there's really very little halo contribution in the sample, so, so I haven't looked. But it would be very interesting to look at maps in the halo. <laughs> maybe someday you'll see Give them time. Give them time. And on that note, I think um, we'll thank Joe again. For, I mean, he is around the rest of the day. Um, I know there's one more.